taught us thinking, where we'll be asking, does the men's rights movement have a point? Um, I'm Luke Bedimer. I'm one of the, the reporters here at Tortoise, and I'm really grateful to be joined by Liz Mosley, who's one of the partners and editors here, and also William Costello, who is a doctoral psychologist, um, but m has most recently studied the psychology of incels and the incel ideology. And I hope that also joining us remotely, we've got Dr. John Barry, who's a, 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 a chartered psychologist. Hi, John. Um, and the co-founder of the Center for Male Psychology. Um, I just wanted to say at the top that it, it feels a little bit difficult, I think, as a newsroom and an individual to look past what's happening in Ukraine at the moment, especially today. But um, without dwelling on this too much, I thought to myself this afternoon, I think there's a reason why Putin's approach to, to politics for the past few years has been called strong man politics rather than strong person politics. Um, so I don't know whether that's a theme that we could return to at the end or just something to think about, but I hope this conversation will be useful. And if you haven't been to a thinking before, uh, welcome. The whole point is that we try to reach a more reasoned, uh, empathetic understanding of a difficult topic together. So it's not a panel Q&A. Um, we really want to hear what you guys think. Um, and that doesn't mean you have to wait till a certain point to say something. My colleague Ed has a microphone. If you want to speak, put your hand up. Um, we do have a really loosely enforced rule that there are no questions. But um, that's mostly because we want to hear your point of view. Um, but if there's something you really want to know, I, I guess you can ask. Um, so yeah, I think that it would be really helpful to start um, Liz, not least because you just recently, in fact, both you, Liz and William, recently attended a men's rights conference to try to do, a, as dispassionately as possible, a, a list of the things that fall into the, the remit of men's rights. And that might give us a starting point for some of the things we could talk about, not least because the slides, which were just up there, they cover some of it, but certainly not all. So I don't know, Liz, but that would be really helpful. Sure. So. I definitely think if you want to get an understanding of what the men's rights movement is all about, you should ask a divorced middle-aged lesbian. So <laughs> very happy to contribute my insight. Um, but I did go to the conference. Um, it was online just before Christmas. You were there too, William. And um, went deliberately to see what it is all about um, as a sort of, I guess, a card-carrying feminist. And it was surprising. Some of my expectations were confounded. There was a lot more in there than I was anticipating. And I've just, there's too many, there's too many, a bit like feminism is like a really massive bucket of loads of stuff. And people who believe in certain elements of those things might call themselves a feminist or they might not call themselves a feminist and then the other feminists tell the other feminists that they aren't good enough feminists. That all is true for the men's rights movement too. Um, so I've just picked out a few of the sort of, I guess, key sort of tenets of what uh, uh, yeah. the, the concerns of people that were being talked about at the conference. And it includes things like, in some of the slides, um, uh, reference this, um, but people who advocate for and campaign for really a, a better quality dialogue and improved awareness of the specific um, factors that affect uh, men's poor mental health um, and advocating for better access to mental health services specifically designed for men. That's one element of it. Um, and, and especially encouraging dialogue about, around male suicide, which obviously the rates mm. of male suicide are, 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 are Horrible. So that's one element of it. There's um, a sort of aspect of it which is around real concern for the underachievement of boys in the education <coughs> system. That's an element of it too. Um, there is a strong belief that there is bias um, and some people think corruption in the family courts that disadvantages fathers in particular and fathers' relationships with their children. And the, the sort of father-child relationship is a big element of concern in the men's rights movement. Com comes up in lots of different ways, comes up in different people's attitude to abortion and thinking of abortion as a father's issue and things like that. Um, there are also people who argue that the criminal justice system is um, unduly punitive for men as opposed to women. And there are sort of... Um, uh, same same sentence, same crime. I think um, Luke, you were talking about it's more a thing in the states. I think, but there's sort of people who cite there's this many men in prison, but only this 
few women in prison, and that is evidence that the criminal justice system is harsher on men than it is on women. And another one is that people who believe that, for example, domestic violence and rape statistics are exaggerated by false vexatious reporting to a, like a really material extent, mm -hmm. and that the ruination of, of men and boys who've been accused of domestic violence and rape is a, a dramatically under-discussed and under-served uh, issue. So that's the sense of it. There are probably 20 more things. Mm. Well, not least in the, the things that we kind of saw when we were researching this. And I, it was an important point to me, at least, that they kind of range from seemingly not banal, but very middle ground, not much sticking point and not much to argue about in terms of just what should be offered to people in the world, mental health support, uh, support around suicide and suicidal ideation, I guess, through to some quite extreme stuff, which on the face of it, I don't think anybody in this room would agree with. I don't know if we want to get into some of that stuff right now, just as like a, to put a, a stake in the ground, but yeah, so, I mean, some of the things I've just read out are mm. hard for me to read out without, you know, doing an mm. eye roll and falling on the ground. But there is, there are, there are some aspects in the conference, and it was a, it, it, I thought it was going to be a massive conference. It was called, like, the International mm. Co Men's Rights Conference or something like that. And it ran 24 hours a day for six days. So they've got a long, they've got a big agenda that they want to talk about, right? And so we, um, with um, Kim and... Uh, Ella, I can't see, um, Ellen, uh, we registered as, uh, as press and went along and um, were able to observe the chat as well as the official content. It was like webinars and stuff like that and then there were people watching. But I turned up to, um, it was a week before Christmas, what a treat, super festive. And I turned up to a, um, a session, I watched William's session and, and I turned up to a session about um, parental alienation, which is the family courts thing. And in the chat, there were people discussing that um, circumcision is equivalent to female genital mutilation. Mm -hmm. And it was absolutely a cloak for anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, in, without doubt, in, in my read on it. So there was a sort of, there, there are elements in the mix that are Trojan horses, I think, for other, for other, mm -hmm. other things that I got a whiff of. Um, and... You know, one I, I kind of can, I couldn't quite tell if it was a joke, but there was there was a back and forth between two of the people observing the conference where, where they were talking about a sort of cabal of lesbian sort of white witches who'd infiltrated the health service. I thought it was a funny joke, if it was a joke. Mm. Interesting. So whilst we're on the subject of the conference, it would be, it would be good to get it's a not little me. bit. I'm okay. not one of those. <laughs> um, to get a bit more detail about, A, how you think it went, um, and to you, William, in particular, having attended not just to sort of observe, but to contribute a bit about why you did that um, and what you think the impact might have been. But Liz, just quickly, your read was, is this a movement that's going somewhere? Did it feel actually like there was something that maybe actually felt a little bit like it was stuck in the, stuck in the mud? Not an interesting. Only, or... tw only twenty-five people were there when, right. I, when I, the session I watched. Um, so it, I didn't feel like I turned up to a sort of you know hundreds of people all over the world. It didn't feel like it was a well attended thing. That's 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 twenty-seven people on a given session. session. Yeah, I think I, one night I, I watched okay. I think three or four, and they were in between twenty-five and thirty-five in general right. like, ish. Yeah, but that doesn't. Most people would watch it later on. If yeah, it's exactly, crazy. exactly. And they, they've they've all published online. You can see it online and what yeah. ha what have you. So it doesn't necessarily mean anything. But I was expecting a bigger crowd. I suppose mm. is what I was saying. Um, and um, what it definitely did do because I did go into it thinking, you know. So James James Harding, who's our boss here, talks to us a lot about. When you really think you're right about something, you have to work really, really hard to try and think the opposite, just to just to try and get there to like to, as a thought experiment, right? And I am shit at it, absolutely. So I, I kind of went into this thinking, you know, oh, this will be a lol and a bit stupid. It it did give me pause for thought. It really did, and it gave me pause for thought on a number of fronts. Some of the things we're going to talk about this yeah. evening, um, but it. Gave, it did not make me so, so my my feeling is in answer to the question the thinking question that the men's rights movement 
absolutely does have a point, but it's not the point that it thinks it has. Right. We must come back to that. Um, William, so, d again, I said a moment ago, wh why did you get involved? What do yeah. you feel like you got out of it, and what do you, do you hope people who perhaps saw your talk got out of it? Um, yeah, well, I got involved uh, primarily because my area of research is an overwhelmingly male domain. There, there's not many female in cells for uh, many different reasons. But uh, yeah, like you said, it, the men's rights movement is a kind of a broad church, just like feminism is. And if you wanted to, you could wake up in the morning and cherry pick some really egregious examples and lampoon those, whether that's feminism or uh, men's rights movement. Um, but there's a kind of a stigma attached to calling yourself uh, a men's rights activist. I don't even call myself a men's rights activist because primarily I'm not an activist uh, like others in the men's rights movement who are doing kind of more work um, uh, than I. But I'm, I'm an egalitarian and I believe that when one sex loses, both sexes lose and that men and women are actually each other's best ally um, for the most part uh, throughout our evolutionary history and currently today. And any concerted efforts to get men and women to hate each other fall flat uh, in the face of half a million years worth of evolution that's driving us to love each other. Um, I think as an egalitarian, there is obviously areas where women are marginalized and uh, uh, don't, don't succeed uh, as much as men. But there, it's equally obvious to me that there are areas uh, where men are um, marginalized and uh, don't end up on top. But what gets me is this characterization of history forever and always as a male privileged, uh, male oppressive patriarchy that's benefited men, when in actual fact it hasn't benefited most men much at all. For example, for the most uh, of our evolutionary history, it's been men overwhelmingly sent to die and as fodder in war solely men rather than uh, women. So that's a, a big area uh, to talk about in terms of a patriarchy. It, it, and it, what happens is we're told that men live in a male privileged uh, patriarchy that they benefit from and the areas in which they don't succeed and are, uh, suffer is also their fault. So it's toxic masculinity. So it sounds like gaslighting and victim blaming all in the one thing. Um, just to touch the point on the circumcision area, I can't speak to which talk uh, you, you attended, but it is a big issue in the men's rights movement, and I'd encourage you all to look into it. And there's a Netflix documentary called American Circumcision. Uh, everywhere in the world that FGM is practiced, male genital mutilation is practiced as well, and often in more severe uh, ways. That isn't the case always. Um, it is uh, the most common surgery in America, and it is a cos cosmetic surgery performed on non-consenting baby boys who have their religious and bodily autonomy taken away often at six days old. And often, up until the 1990s, it was done without anesthetic. And mothers have given interviews about their experience of watching their baby boy get circumcised without anesthetic. And they go into catatonic shock. And the mother says, I had to leave the room, really. And I, it didn't really sit right with me, but it's just, Everybody does it. And there's a, a deep history there of uh, why that is. And uh, Dr. Kellogg of Kellogg's Corn Flakes, actually, has a puritanical roots in why that was uh, made as a common surgery in America. W w can I just stop you for a moment? Because uh, despite it being an interesting mm. topic, um, it's one of many. Yeah. And I, I just wanted to press you on the point of uh, some of the statements you've made there. Were those the, the types of statements that you were making given your platform at the conference, or were you focused more on the, the research that you'd done yeah, into so my, in cell size? My Second. talk at the conference was really just uh, very narrowly, I think it was a 15-minute uh, recording we had to put, uh, mm. put online. And that was primarily about my master's yeah. research. So, so w w did you feel like you were holding back some of the observations and statements and opinions you, you've just voiced now? Or it was basically people had showed up to listen to you talk about something in particular, and you didn't feel like you wanted to? Blur the, blur the boundaries. Um, I didn't really make many of those points I just made just now, just because they weren't really salient to the incel research. Mm -hmm. but, um, but it was a men's rights conference. That's right, yeah, yeah. it was. Yeah. Uh, I made these points kind of debating against my own girlfriend, actually, at Goldsmith University. You can check that out on YouTube. That's a, f a fun watch. Uh, but people couldn't believe that my feminist girlfriend and I could have this fierce debate on stage and disagree passionately about 
uh, gender dynamics and sex wars and things like this, and then go to the pub after and very much be in love and go home and carry on with life. Uh, mm. kind of, the discourse has become so polarized, polarized now that it's, that person is an MRA. I can't ever be around them. And it, right. it, 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 that doesn't make sense to me. It um, can tell a multitude of identities. And, yeah, yeah there's, there's a lot there that I think yeah. we ought to touch on. I'm conscious I want to give uh, John Barry a chance to weigh in, not just because um, he may well have some thoughts on what's been said, but also because I'd love to know whether there's any of that uh, description just there about the way that the narratives are functioning, dominant narratives, that is, in society are functioning that might have prompted you to set up the Centre for Male Psychology or to be one of the co-founders of the Centre for Male Fi Psychology. Um, and if it's not that, what, what, was your, what was your motivation, John? Hi, well, my motivation uh, really started, um, and I didn't realise at the time, but when I was an undergraduate and we were spending a lot of time um, discussing female depression, which is an important topic because uh, women tend to experience a major depression twice the rate that men do. Um, but when we went on, uh, we, we talked all about the, the different theories that would explain this, and it was a very thorough job, and I, I thought that was an excellent reflection of what psychology should be about. But then when we started talking about male suicide, it was a completely different situation. And suddenly the, the tutor had gone from, from being uh, very scientific in their approach to explain, well, three quarters of suicides are, are male. And why is that? Well, it's because men are better at DIY, so they make more effective ways of killing themselves. And there was a little kind of giggle around the room uh, as if this was a bit of comedy. And, and I kind of, I just thought, is something wrong with me. I'm, I'm not getting this joke. Uh, and, and that was it. I was expecting some more, but, but we just kind of, we moved on to the next topic. And, and I just, I was outside the, uh, the, the library then talking to a couple of people. They're saying, you know, I don't know how you could sit there just saying nothing when, when that was going on. And I thought I was the only one who had noticed. But, uh, you know, I, I think that, that type of attitude, which has been characterized as, as an empathy gap for uh, men's suffering, I think it is something that's very common in our society, unfortunately. Um, we seem to have this, this attitude, as William said, about, you know, if men have got problems, we, we tend to, to victim blame them. We, we tend to say it's, it's their own fault that they've had these problems. So anyway, as an undergraduate, uh, um, that just sort of stuck in the back of my mind. Um, and then I went through the, the rest of my master's degree and PhD, and I, and I was ended up working as a researcher in women's mental health. Um, I, but all this time, I, I was still I was being aware of what was being, being talked about by my colleagues in psychology and in the media. And I was, I was you know, being increasingly uh, aware and disturbed by the fact that nobody seemed to really have any interest in investigating why men kill themselves at three times the rate that women do. And, I, and eventually I met somebody in the BPS, the British Psychological Society, a clinical psychologist called Martin Seeger, who said, I think I'm on exactly the same line as you, and, we sh and, uh, and I'm trying to start a male psychology section of the BPS, and together we, we, uh, we, uh, we campaigned for that to happen, and we, we were lucky enough in 2018 to be able to do that, uh, which is 30 years behind the, the psychology of women section being started in the British Psychological Society. But I, I think it's it's a really key issue. I mean, the, the fact that that so many people can be very blasé about an issue that's as serious as suicide, I, I think it, it is a question that we should all really ask ourselves. So, John, I, I read on the website for the centre um, that you view part of the purpose um, of under, better understanding male psychology. Uh, is to um, help to find solutions to big global challenges. Um, and that it was sort of left at that, uh, and forgive me if I'm a bit uh, ignorant of the rest of the website, but could you just illuminate that a little bit? Like what was your, what's the thinking there in connecting an understanding of male psychology to solving big global challenges, as you put it? Okay, well, I think what's happening, I mean, we like to think about men's psychology has been something that's a social construct. Um, but it's a fact that men's psychology tends to be quite similar around the world. So for example, there was a study done by Ellis in 2011, which looked at, at uh, different 
uh, psychological constructs, different behavioral activities, and he found that that um, there were sex differences in these things uh, in virtually every place that he looked. So there's something about men that is similar around the world, and I think there's something about the the the, the this empathy gap that that seems to be happening quite globally too. So I think anything that you're doing, and and of course because we live in a global village now, anything that we're doing in the UK, I think hopefully will have an impact on other parts of the world, just as happens in re reverse. I mean, the, the APA, the American Psychological Society, issued guidelines on therapy for, for men and boys in 2018, um, which have been very controversial and, and a lot of people have criticized them, although the APA haven't taken any notice of this, apparently haven't changed a thing. But uh, you know that has been quite influential, and you know we, we do have people being trained now to see men not as being human beings, really, with their own individual issues and their own personal histories that need to be helped in the way that therapists have always tried to help men. But we're seeing more now as being um, uh, uh, consequences of of whatever social uh, construct has uh, we've learned to 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 ape and emulate. Uh, and also uh, as our, our behavior and our problems are seen as a result of patriarchy. So you end up in a situation where you have a, a common situations for a man to feel, feel depressed if he loses his job. But this is now seen as something, you know, his depression is his own fault. I mean, his depression is about the fact that he's lost power and control in the household. You know, he's, he's become less of, of, of a patriarch in the household. So the, there's this very unsympathetic this, this empathy gap again, this very unsympathetic view of men, which is not therapeutic. It's, it, this is not the thing that's gonna help men. Mm. Thanks for that, John. There, there is a point there about the empathy gap. And I think being more decisive and potentially more democratic about the way that we decide where there's an empathy gap and actually where there's a, a total misunderstanding and potentially a problem of what the intentions and motivations and things behind pushing a particular agenda are. I don't know whether we could come up with a way to decide what's an empathy gap and what is a, a fundamental disagreement. But um, I want to, I, uh, sorry, I should remind you, please, anybody who's got thoughts on what's been said already, do weigh in. And also, um, I should have said also at the top, there's a chat function in Zoom. And it would be great. I can see uh, that my colleague Ellen has um, made some interesting contributions. So it would be great to come to her um, and also potentially to Emma. Um, but Liz, I, I want to put a point to you about the idea that um, in this big range of topics, some of the ones that we came, with, came up with at the start and then others that we didn't mention, um, how, how do you think we're going to decide where there's an empathy gap, and actually the men's rights movement may well have a point on it, and where actually we're dealing with what you could call it a toxic or a harmful ideology that is pushing for something fundamentally wrong. Like, do, we, do you have any mechanisms? Do you have any ideas about what we might do to... So it's sort of like a separating the, yeah. the wheat from the chaff. Yes, for sure. Um, <clears throat> so some, some, some of the um, things I listed at the beginning, there's 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 da irrefutable data on, mm. you know, that we know is true, and um, that helps us to know that we're not dealing with an empathy gap. We're dealing with just facts that that one 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 set of views is right and one set of views is wrong. So that, those things are relatively straightforward to resolve. Um, what is um, if you a lot of this though is 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 about emo emotional. It's about people's experiences and how they feel and what have you. So. Um, and that's where ideology is, and, and in, I, I would interpret it from what I saw in the conference world, um, absolutely not an expert. Williams lived and breathed this much more than I, is, I would call it mythology, um, is that the, um, th th these are people who observe or experience the thing themselves, sorry, uh, or observe a, a piece of data or, or, or even sometimes an anecdote and are able to assemble that. It's just like all ways of believing. You're able to assemble the data available to you to mm. create your worldview, like you described a, a, a feminist view could, could do as well. Yeah. And 
um, it's a very potent form of propaganda. So one of the sessions that I watched was included an absolutely horrendous piece of film. And by the way, there's women who are men's rights activists too, which I didn't realise, um, of a, just the most awful story of a man who had been married to a woman who was incredibly violent and the woman ended up killing their child that they'd had together. And this is sort of presented as, he, here's a typical story of what really happens in abusive relationships. And it's, my, it's not only my view, but it's also the view of, irrefutable data that that is not the, the typical setup of what happens in abusive relationships it just isn't mm. now that doesn't mean that what happened in that family wasn't absolutely terrible it really was it was really upsetting to watch and this poor man honestly um but that's not you, you that is used as a vehicle to say and therefore you know um women are as violent as men in in, right. in, in, in re, uh, domestic relationships. It just isn't true. Yeah. Can I just come back on that? Because there's meta studies do show that women are as likely to initiate violence. It just comes in different forms through throwing missiles, hitting with an object, things like that. That is the case. Um, we just actually don't acknowledge it as much because we don't perceive female aggression and men don't actually think it's all that bad. They don't actually acknowledge when they've been victimized. Uh, but the data is very clear on that. And I can point you to all the studies, if you like, the meta studies that have shown that e equally as likely to. What's a, meta a meta study is where it looks at all the literature on that topic, collects all the data from all the studies that have ever been done on that topic and see what, it, it, what consensus it forms. I'll just give you an anecdotal piece of evidence that kind of illustrates my point. Uh, I'm also, alongside my PhD, I do my therapeutic counseling qualifications. And um, we were talking about passive aggression. And my female classmate um, said, yeah, I'm a passive aggressive person. Uh, you know, I, I'll give my mate the silent treatment. And, you know, I'll, maybe if I get really angry, I'll just like throw things at him. And everyone started laughing. And I was kind of thinking, in what sense is throwing something at your partner passive aggression. But this was totally just swept under the rug. And I just think, it, it, a, a kind of an acid test, you asked, how will we know what's an empathy gap? A good thought experiment. And by no means do I think we should treat men and women the exact same. I think that's a recipe for disaster. I think there are fundamental biological differences that need to be taken into account in things like sport, for example, that mean you don't treat each other the exact same. Um, but take that example, if I had said, in the counseling class. Oh yeah, when I'm angry at my partner, I just hit her or throw something at her. What would happen? So you could, to deal with that empathy gap or to kind of sense check yourself against it, you can say, if it was reversed, if this point was made with the sexes reversed, well, how would we feel? What would we think? And I think that's very clear. You know, we would feel uncomfortable if I, uh, as a male, I said that. And unless, you know, are we looking for equality or not, you know? Mm. Um, Liz, I'll give you a chance to respond to that if you want to. And I, I know that John has his hand up. I'm interested in the idea of bringing anecdotes to what I think we would agree is a, a data fight, but also the idea that the data may not always point us to the right policy intervention or the right way of tackling an issue. But um, I'd love to go to John, but Liz, do you have... I, I just can't get on board. I just can't... I, I understand the anecdote that you've told about the person who made the joke about throwing something at your boyfriend, uh, but I don't, I can't, I can't draw a line from that anecdote to women are as as violent as men. I just, mm. I just, I just can't get on, that. On the, certainly not it's letting the so anecdote case. speak for itself, but the data. I can put the studies in the chat if you want, maybe after or something like that, but show right. you. Um, where, where do you see the asymmetry as coming from then? Because the, there's an argument to say that we should use the data on instances of violence, injuries. Uh, are you all more familiar th with this than I am? There's on domestic violence. Um, but we should use it to try and create policy that is better for society at large. Um, is that ever at odds, do you think, with the idea of it being gendered and being better for men, or indeed better for women, for a particular policy intervention to happen? So, like I, so, so I live in a world where it is less safe for me to walk from here to the tube than it is for, for example, you to walk from here to the tube, just simply because, it, you know, it, you know, when we last had a, a, a um, uh, thinking about feminism just before Christmas, 
the next day there was a dude with a machete on Oxford Street. You know, this, mm. this is the reality of it. The, the vi violent men thunder behind closed doors and on the streets, they do. And violent women do not. Mm. It, it is simply right. not the case. And so that is not to say that men aren't beaten up in the street because they are. Mm. Uh, absolutely. It, it is just simply not the case that men are as physically as at risk from women as women are as at risk from men. It is simply not right. the case. The capacity to inflict damage, I'd agree with you there, is uh, skewed. But uh, men are the primary victims of violent men. W William, can we, overwhelmingly. Can, can we pause for a moment on that? Because I'm conscious that John has his hand up, and I'd love to hear what he says. Um, John, are you there? Right. I, I thought I needed to wait for you to unmute me, sorry. But, uh, yeah, I was just going to say that the, the gender empathy gap is, is about uh, the difference in empathy that people have for a man versus a woman who are in the same situation. About 30% of, of uh, this is ONS data, uh, Office for National Statistics, uh, about 30% uh, of um, the victims of domestic violence are male victims of female violence. Um, so, and there's the, the Mankind Initiative who are very good in this area. If, if you're a male victim of domestic violence, you should contact them. Um, they did a very interesting um, uh, experiment, kind of live uh, experiment, uh, something along the lines of William was just talking about. They had two actors, a man and a woman, uh, taking it in turns to be aggressive towards each other and push each other around. When the, the man was pushing the woman, uh, people intervened, they were all over the situation. When the woman was pushing the man and berating the man, people were laughing, nobody came to help at all. That, that's an empathy gap. I think what, that- what do, you, what do you think to, to Liz's point about the issue, not necessarily of that, uh, the, the examples being performed in that video, but the fact that we see overwhelmingly violent crime, mass shootings, mass stabbings, um, and indeed the individual you mentioned with the machete just outside this, this office, um, they're overwhelmingly men. Yeah, I think her point was also that, that women are less safe than men. Men are about twice as likely to be murdered and about twice as likely almost to, to be the victim of any kind of violence than women are. Again, this is ONS data, recent data. Um, yeah, men can be violent. This is a problem. And, and just one of the things that we're interested in, the male psychology section of the BPS and also the Centre for Male Psychology. Um, now, why are men violent? That's a really interesting question. And I think if we want to, to get uh, to the roots of, of uh, solving this pro problem, rather than just talking about it and rather than just blaming men, we have to really try and understand what the roots of the problem are. Um, what I've been finding is that, uh, and a lot of clinical psychologists will, will bear this out, is that men tend to become violent, aggressive, abuse substances uh, when they have mental health issues, basically. So you get a lot of men who, and uh, uh, some people think that this isn't uh, some excuse for violent behavior. It isn't at all. Um, and if, if people are violent or, uh, you know, they, they should be held to account for that. But it also needs to be understood. If you want to prevent people from being violent, you have to understand why that is. And for men, often it is a result of, uh, here's a, 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 a good example is PTSD uh, related to combat. Okay, so a lot of people know about combat stress. Now, a lot of these men have, have terrible um, problems trying to control their temper. They might have insomnia. They might be very irritable. They might fall to substance abuse as a way of trying to, to self-medicate. Now, if we want to, to try and prevent th that sort of violence and violence from other men who might have uh, been abused as children in some sort of way, physically or sexually, who, uh, who then, you know, have no other real outlet because their behavior is always seen as they grow up as being a challenging behavior, being naughty behavior. If we want to actually solve these sorts of problems, we have to get to the roots of them and help these people rather than just blame them. It's another type of victim blame. Right. Um, thanks for that, John. I've, I've let it run on a little bit long, but uh, we try in the middle of the thinking to do a, a bit of a slowdown. So we're going to take a pause um, and just give it two minutes so that the people in the room can talk to one another. So look to the person next to you, not necessarily the person that you came with, but um, have a think, have a chat about the question and the stuff you've heard thus far. Um, and we'll be back in about two minutes to, uh, to carry on. Thanks, everyone. Um, I, I would love to know what... Is that me or you, Liz? I think it's me, but I'm so sorry. <laughs> 
I feel like I'm um, rattling. Yeah. Um, I'd love to know what some of you were talking about. I can see uh, Nimmo's got a hand up, so it'd be excellent to actually just come straight to you, Nimmo. Hi. Um, okay, so I think that the question that I've had, I know that we're not supposed to ask questions, but um, the question that I've had throughout this discussion has been like, why and who? Because I think that we've asked the question, does the men's rights movement ha have a point? And then, you know, various issues have been brought and men are disproportionately impacted by X, Y, and Z. And then it's kind of just stopped there at data points or whatever, or like analogies and anecdotes. And I would like to ask the question why these things are happening. Um, and when you start to ask those questions, I think in broader senses, it's usually because we have gendered roles in society and those gendered roles come from patriarchy. And that's not an unempathetic point. That is to say that patriarchy harms most people. And, you know, prescribing roles onto complex billions of people will inevitably harm people. And so I don't think that's an unempathetic point to say that. I think it's a point to explain where these things are coming from. And I think the other question that I had was who, like, which men? For example, men are disproportionately being sent to prison which men are those men? It's working class men, it's, it's men of color, it's black men. And when you start to ask those questions, you start to see, well, is the common denominator gender and sex, or is it race, is it class? And to kind of abstract gender from issues intersecting like capitalism, like white supremacy, um, like, you know, whatever, all the isms that we can think of in, in like a, a more, you know, broader sense of the term. I'm being really general here, but mm. like, you know, is, 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 is kind of the point that I'm making. And then, you know, also men are being sent to go to war. Okay. Why? Is it because there are gendered ideas of what men should be and where women should be? And, ex and who are those men? Is it working class men or is it rich men? Is it young men or is it older men? And I think once we start asking those questions, where are they placed, where are they being sent to? I think having these blanket conversations, it becomes really difficult to actually address the issues that we're all concerned by, which are mental health crises, which is suicide being uh, uh, disproportionately high amongst men how do we get to actual solutions if mm. we're being so general? Yeah. And, 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 and are we actually addressing the underlying issues going on here? Or are we kind of, I don't know, it's an yeah. open-ended question there. No, it's, it's helpful, Nima. I guess one thing is that, not least, we've got two people who've been to one here, uh, three in fact, maybe more. There are men's rights conferences going on and people coalescing around that idea. Um, and in asking a question like this, and I'd be the first to admit, it's not the perfect one, um, but there are many you could ask, and maybe this is one of the ones that you should. Um, there are people coalescing around the idea of men's rights, and I think it's helpful for us as a newsroom, as an individual, to think, is that something that I should tolerate in society? The fact that this is happening, that there are conferences, people investing in it. Were there people advertising goods, products, services at no, I don't conference? Know. No. So I, I, I completely hear your point, Nemo. It's a good one. And I think that the uh, having had a conversation about data, we'd also need to understand intersectional data, or at least data that represents a whole range of different categories. But we, we, we certainly also should be thinking, look, is men's rights as a, as a movement and a thing that we could go and visit something that we should be putting up with? So, I mean, we asked, we asked the question in the chat, um, do you think it does more harm than good, the fact that there is a men's rights movement? And maybe that's also a way of getting to whether we should stand for it being a thing or not, given um, we, we all have a choice. Liz? Just, just to, to Nimo's point, because she's absolutely right, of course, patriarchy harms men and women, but that this movement, as I've observed it a little bit, does blur out all of those nuances. Mm. It, it is designed, I think, to, um, to fill in the gaps. And not, and not everybody in it, and not like the things we said at the beginning, but I think that it is a very compelling, simple, because that's how these things work, uh, n narrative for frustrated men. Um, and the, the idea that patriarchy harms men and women in itself, I'm not sure is fully embraced by a lot of the people in the movement who rather like 
patriarchy. And the problem is when my patriarchal status, and I think it was said before, is somehow I feel disempowered and emasculated because I, maybe I lose my job. Or once I go away from that sort of patriarchal template, then I'm in trouble. So it would be better if that stayed. Right. And, and, and my, my sort of whole sort of beef with the ideological rationale for some of these issues and my, my real problem with it as a movement, because it does blur out the nuances, it prevents proper discussion of the things that really matter, is that the sort of underlying and sometimes it's said and sometimes it's unsaid reason for all these challenges that men are really facing in real life in their day to day is women right and and, and that's kind of where we are part company with it yeah good i'd love to give you the chance when you give it one second it would be great if we could get um, my colleague ellen because she's made points to me in person earlier this week um words to that effect i think that liz was just saying and you had a point earlier ellen in the chat about Effect, an, sort of an effective zero-sum game. And I wondered if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I think one of the things, one of the senses that I got in this week when Liz and Kim and I were, um, were following the conference um, was that it was about almost men's rights as kind of exclusionary. So the feeling that women's rights had gone too far, which was something that was explicitly said by... Um, by a number of the participants, and that somehow men had been losing out. And the, the kind of discourse was, you know, that they had to be reclaimed and that it was a battle rather than that this was part of a project of equality where, um, you know, improvements in women's rights and women's opportunities go hand in hand with those of men. And that was something that I found um, quite difficult and I think if you look into kind of the the broader work of the conference organizers is something that runs quite deep um, which yeah so uh, yeah I agree with what Liz said basically. Do you think that if 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 uh, even the move the conference and the movement and the individuals that you saw could be sort of rehabilitated from that view that this is a zero sum game and that um, we're, we're, we're locked in a, a sort of struggle of narratives in which only one gender could win to focus more on detailed issues, the, the likes of which I think most of us would agree were important. Like, is that an avenue towards something better? Or do you think that the idea of men's rights, even the term itself is like, is, is beyond repair? I mean, look, I'm not sure that everybody who would advocate for men's rights would have that kind of view that I just said but if we're talking about the men's rights movement and if you're trying to think about okay who were the sort of the leading voices in that movement from my understanding of who those people are and the work that they've produced over many many decades I'm not sure that they would be willing to kind of rehabilitate that view it seems pretty ingrained and quite kind of fundamental to their approach so it's not to say you know as we've been saying throughout this thinking that there aren't very valid concerns and that, I mean, that they are issues of men's rights or men's well-being and and everything. But um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I think that it very easily gets mixed up together when you look at who's kind of leading what we think of as this movement, running this international conference of men's rights. Um, that more, in my opinion, kind of nasty, uh, you know, view that underlines it, it's deeply ingrained in what those individuals at least believe and are doing. Um, thanks, Ellen. William, you wanted to... Yeah, uh, just to pile, pile to touch on just what you said. Uh, I think I kind of agree that if uh, I said um, before we started that if some of the voices that I've heard from the men's rights movement were the first voices I heard in that community, I would have ran a mile. But then I also heard the voices of people like Dr. John Barry and Elizabeth Hobson and other people who are doing great work uh, to actually uh, advance uh, the causes of both sexes. One of the most prominent men's rights activists is a guy called uh, Dr. Warren Farrell. And his whole tagline is, when one sex loses, both sexes lose. Does it, he completely is not against the whole idea of it being zero sum. He thinks that men and women are each other's greatest allies and always have been. Um, just been uh, to just pick up on, uh, I think it's a little bit of a disservice to the diversity of topics that were actually on show throughout that uh, the whole conference. 
uh, and it actually was quite intersectional in my opinion. There was talks on specifically black male sexual victimization, uh, Indian experience. There was a, a whole wealth of diversity on show in my opinion. Um, I agree with this idea of grand narratives are seductive for anyone in explaining their world view. And uh, there is the thing called gynocentrism. And pr probably a lot of thought leaders within the MRA are the ones at least whose voices are most amplified. And that's another question we have to ask. Why are we amplifying, amplifying the most toxic voices in that sphere rather than people like Dr. Barry? Uh, and more reasonable people, you know, give, maybe brand the MRA movement a little bit uh, less corrosively. Um, but yeah, perhaps they would see the world as a gynocentrism. That every, and if the only tool you have is a hammer, everything will look like a nail. But I would put it to you that on the flip side, patriarchy is this nebulous grand narrative that is always swept out as a, a grand explanation for everything and very little drilling down into the nuts and bolts underneath it. It's just cause of patriarchy. That's often trotted out. So I think, you know, it's the ultimate nebulous grand narrative. Uh, but you have the flip side with MRAs who come out with gynocentrism. But yeah, like I said, it, it, you, can, you could wake up in the morning and find any amount of evidence to fuel your worldview. I could wake up and say, I'm a feminist this morning. I'm going to find a ton of evidence that shows that women are more victimized than men. You can get it. Mm. If you wake up the next day as an MRA, you can find a load of evidence that shows the world is gynocentric. It's obviously somewhere in the middle. Thanks. Well, I, Kim, you wanted to come in on that. If you get you a microphone. Um, I was just going to say one thing, which is that um, I kind of felt at that conference like there was just a few things which felt quite damaging. So, like, um, I mean, so Mike Buchanan, who ran it, he, he uh, has tried to run for parliament. And in his manifesto, he said that um, the reason that so many boys go into STEM is because of aptitude reasons. And then there was, like, discussions on whether uh, women leaders caused bad share performance, stuff like that, that just felt quite ugly things to you know, bring up and felt like it, you know, we'd moved on from those things. I thought it were. Mm. Thanks, Kim. Um, so I, I'm aware John's, John's got his hand up again. It would be uh, fair to give him a chance to respond to that, not least because he was mentioned. But um, Liz, a question to you would be, is it worth doing the process of trying to work out why these quite toxic, harmful voices have managed to surge to the front of the movement um, and organize conferences like this? Um, or is it not worth trying to do that working out and saying this is something that we don't value as a society and maybe that we, in fact, condemn? Uh, I think it's worth uh, trying to uh, gain consensus on we talked about the tip of the iceberg, didn't we? Mm -hmm. You know, like and the most in in any ideology, there's there's extreme ones and then the people in the middle. You know, and I think it is worth um, doing a reasonable job of understanding how the elements of the men's rights movement ideology, how widespread they are, mm -hmm. because there are different aspects to it, and then taking a view as to how problematic we think that is, because I do worry. I absolutely worry about elected representatives, MPs opting to address, they pulled out in, in the end, but opting to address a conference of people who, ha who hold, to my mind, extremely misogynistic views and who, and who do engage in r really m you know, misogynistic person. Not everybody, but some, and they were there and present in this conference. And I worry about, I think that is a, I worry about you know, elected representatives legitimising a movement that has re really dangerous potential um, ramifications for women in real life. And that, so I guess further to my question about trying to look past the voices that we've mentioned that are being amplified and the ones that you referenced, Kim, there, um, to see a way in which we can bring people who would attend a men's rights conference but don't necessarily, as you said, they would have run a mile if they'd known. Yeah. To bring those, what, where do those, what, what movement, what initiative, what ideas do you think those people can be brought onto if not men's rights? 
Well, if it's mental health, it's mental health. If mm. you're worried about the rights for veterans, then it's rights for veterans. If it's, you know, um, better parenting, mm -hmm. then that all, it all exists in other places. Yeah. You don't have to package it up and right. say, you know, this is all the problem. I think that's a really helpful observation, right? Because if, if we were willing to take more of a, um, a discreet, whether it's community focused or issue focused approach, that might well lead us. In. I, I left recalling uh, comments and things that I've read on in the research I was doing today, which led me to some quite um, extreme areas. Reading people observe that that's not what the women's rights movement has has done. It, it's still got the broad umbrella category. It's still widely celebrated as something that is in its own right a woman, women's rights movement. Um, and then it's been permitted to drill down into these areas. And, and um, these the people who are deeply angry about that fact, um, I can see the, the reasons why there's a special movement on that front. But how do you convince people who are, who are outraged by that fact, by that difference? Oh, I mean, you know, the women's rights movement has done a fairly poor job of bringing, you know, non-misogynistic men along, <laughs> along with it over the last hundred years, and it's fighting with itself. So I don't, I don't know the answer to that question, Luke. I, don't mm. know. I wish I did. I'd do it if I knew. Yeah. It just sounds like a little bit, just quickly, um, that we could talk about all these men's issues as long as we don't mention that they're men's issues. That, that just sounds... But that, that's bad. your observation from hearing that we should... It's sort of like break, break out the... Mental health issues, but uh, don't mention that these are... Uh, disproportionately men suffering from it. So right. It doesn't make sense. Why not? Well, if that's the case, why not? Um, I'd love to give you a chance, Kim. I, uh, John's got his hand up, so it'd be great to hear from him. And then you've got the microphone there. But John, please, uh, briefly on that, if you could. Right. Um, I'm a psychologist. I don't know all that much about the, the, the men's rights movement. But uh, I do know that when I started off trying to find out why men commit suicide, I was aware that the men's rights movement were there and they had their answers. I eventually came to realize that, that for example, um, the, the, the issues that they have about the family courts are quite valid because the family courts do put men, in many cases, under a lot of pressure, especially in terms of uh, access to their children. Men don't tend to get fair and equal access to their children post-divorce. And this has a massive mental health impact on them. And it's probably not unconnected um, that about 35% of uh, suicides of middle-aged men are men who have been separated in the last in the previous few months. So this is quite an important issue. So the way I look at the men's rights movement these days is that, do you know what? They're probably right about a lot of things. They just don't say it in a very palatable way. And they don't talk about the patriarchy in a, in a way that lots of feminists like to hear. And as a psychologist, I can tell you that that explanations related to patriarchy are not of any value in, in the therapy room. They're really not going to help. They might help a very few people. Most men would be left completely cold by that. And that's my concern. I'm, I'm concerned that men don't get a, a proper deal when it comes to therapy these days. We've really got to be a bit more male centric when it comes to therapy for men. Right. That, um, Kim, do you, I'll give you a chance to speak and then. Yeah, I was just. I was just really quickly going to say that I don't think it is. I don't think I don't think anyone's saying that they're not men's issues, but I think that um, you don't have to talk about them as sort of like men's rights issues within that movement. You can talk about them via feminism and gender a uh, gender lens that um, that you might call the patriarchy, but you can also talk about in different words, which might be more like understanding in a therapy room, I suppose. I, I, thanks, Kate. I guess the pursuit of semantics that work better for everyone might be something to think about, but I, I feel like that's a well-explored area also. Um, please, could you tell us your name? And, um, yeah, I'm and Finn, thinking? Um, and yeah, what I'm thinking, I just wanted to raise a couple of concerns I had with the evidence you cite as examples of male victimization. I think the first thing which I thought was you saying that um, one big source of male victimization was men being the primary victims of war. And of course, they are victims of war. They get sent to the front lines. But it's very important to raise um, how women are victimized by war, which is, happens massively. I think one example is that uh, I think during the invasion of Berlin at the end of World War II, some estimates say about 50% of the female population of Berlin were raped. And I'm sure similar um, 
And similar things have happened in other invasions and other wars, so I think it's very important to raise that point. Uh, and the other uh, concern I had was you cite some evidence about men being um, more likely to be victims of violent crime than women, and I think in social science research it's, also, it's very important to take into account kind of other factors which um, might influence that, so men being putting themselves in situations which are more likely to predispose them to violence, and of course, you know, that's an issue in its own right, but you've got to ask the questions that if women know they are at higher risk for violence, it is a logical step to take measures which disrupt your own life greatly to keep yourself safe, and that's going to be shown up in the data as women experiencing less violence, even though that doesn't actually decrease the risk of violence, it's just that women have to take more precautions. Um, so I think that's just another point. That's really helpful. I think you articulated well there. One of the points I was trying to make about the fact that even bringing that data doesn't necessarily tell you the whole story about what intervention is required. Um, I, the little flag has gone up. I, William, I'll give you a chance to, to respond to that if, if you'd like, and then we're going to have to finish very yeah, Shabbish. just really quickly on a, a few points that came to my mind. Great observations and uh, great to see everyone so engaged. Isn't it brilliant to be back here in the flesh in a room? That's fantastic. Um, just to pick up on John's point about patriarchy not being very useful uh, as a theory in the therapeutic room, I can't speak to that, but certainly in academic studies, whenever social role theory, which is patriarchy uh, in academic terms, is put up against Evo evolutionary psychology, it just fails miserably in accounting for sex differences uh, any time they're tested together. Um, just to pick up on your point about um, the idea of uh, females being victim of a war, uh, yeah, certainly, and, and it, all, it, it is based around uh, they're actually considered a more uh, valuable evolutionary resource for if you were uh, killing a whole tribe, you'd keep the women alive, <laughs> rape them, and you'd kill the men. So it's like, it's not entirely obvious to me that being killed and disposable is a privilege for men. Rape, being raped and uh, a, a city's women being sacked in that way is terrible, but it's not exactly clear to me that that's uh, evidence of a, a privilege for men to just be killed instead of kept alive. Um, and also just the final one on the more likely to encounter violence. Would we say veering dangerously close to victim blaming of what positions do men put them in, themselves in? What were they wearing when they were in that fight? You know, obviously male aggression is uh, something to take into account, but it is a fact that they are overwhelmingly more likely to encounter other male violence, and it is a dangerous kind of world to navigate. Uh, do women take extra precautions because of this uh, sense of fear around their vulnerability? I would say absolutely yes, and I would actually go as far as to say as those are evolved mechanisms to feel that threat and take actions to prevent it. Um, you know, that doesn't feel so good to be a woman taking these extra precautions, but they do result in extra safety. If the, as a man, I'm always interested in any measure I can take to make myself more, uh, more safe from a fist fight. I never want to be with one again. I had to go through whole school encountering fist fights every few days, and I really wanted to avoid w them. William, if I may, um, Dan, Dan Rawson's make, making a good chat, a, a, bit, a good point in the chat, I think, about the problems with that characterization um, trying to place a hierarchy, I suppose, or a differential value on what it is to experience some extremely awful circumstances in war, which I think we'd agree have applied to people, and it, it certainly is, yeah. um, it hits hard very, it hits very hard today of all days to think about the impact of that. Um, I'm conscious that we've got to finish, and I, I wanted to say that, Liz, I, I feel, I, I was struck by your point about you don't see many successes having been won by the women's rights movement as a sloppy umbrella term, but would you, would you say that you've seen them won by the more specific, the more data-led and the more issues-driven approaches that have been taken sort of under that umbrella? Oh yeah, so so there's been the, the, there's been tons of wins, absolutely, yeah. tons of wins. And, and was them. was the umbrella necessary for those wins? I think it's I think it's helpful as a as a, for solidarity and for yeah. you know potency. I think it I think it has been helpful to coalesce. But I think the wins do tend to come when people coalesce around a specific goal. Yeah. And you know you have to um, 
I, I believe that if you're going to make a difference, whatever your front, whatever your active, type of activist you are, you have to make, you have to do it in two ways. You, if you want to make a difference, you have to make a fuss. And I think that, that, that that's the sort of combination that you have to go for. And if you're going to do that, you have to be quite single-minded about what it is you're pushing for. Right. My, my point about um, the men's rights movement having a point, but it's not the point they think they have, I, I just want to say is that um, what I observe is rage in these men, real rage. And in some cases, it's not quite rage, but it's simmering frustration, anger, despair on a spectrum of those mm. things um, for, as, a, as a response to very real outside influences and world experiences and what have you. Um, and, but what, what's, what feels to me to drive that rage or despair or whatever, wherever you are on the spectrum is not being taken seriously. Right. not being listened to, the empathy gap we've talked about. And uh, they're right about that. Um, but we don't, we don't take misogyny seriously mm. as, a, as a society. We take it nowhere near as seriously as other forms of extremist ideologies that are uh, arguably less dangerous. And so for, for, for me, and we've published a piece, Mandy Reid, leader of the Women's Equality Party, she's a brilliant feminist, she's a brilliant campaigner, she's an amazing activist, and she makes the case compellingly that we ought to take male violence as seriously as we take other forms of terror threats because it, it is as dangerous. Mm. And so th that's why the men's rights movement has a point. They're right that we don't take them seriously, and we absolutely should. Right. Um, uh, apologies, William, because that's straying right into the territory of your research, and that it, it's, points to me now that I think this is something we'll have to pick up again. Yeah, um, yeah and so just, just very briefly before we, before we finish, because I'm, I'm very grateful for everyone who's weighed in and the chat's been extremely interesting. Um, I think some of the phrases that between uh, your, yourself, Kim, and Ellen used was, it, it builds up a picture of a, a collaborative project for equality that doesn't have to be a zero sum game. Um, and can actually use some of the language that's established by feminism to address in a specific way some of the issues that we would, I think, all agree fit within men's rights but and are a good point to make about mental health, about suicide, um, but at the moment they are in a very ineffective vehicle and it's a vehicle that um, if you see some of the people who are driving it, you would run a mile. Um, there are lots more points that I noted down. I won't do them justice at the moment. Um, but I would say that I think the, the specific point about mental health and um, suicide were the most striking differentials that I saw, and they're in the slides at the beginning. So maybe that's the subject for a more specific conversation next time round that can steer away from men's rights conferences and towards specific interventions and, and ideas. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining. I hope it's been useful, really value your contribution, and we'll, um, we'll hopefully see you next time.